Ma, the meatloaf. <laughs> Wrong show. All right. Hold on, I gotta make a note here. My little notepad. Ooh, uh, cool. My clock was counting down. I felt like we were when it hit zero, we were gonna die. We're going back in time. Somehow. Um. So, welcome to the Calculus of IT podcast, aka the Cognitive Load, aka the home of the digital custodians, aka home of the sad salad and the nexus of the Nether Neverland or Netherland. The nexus of the Netherland, and then the nexus of the Nether. That's the 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 utopian versus dystopian wow. version of the future. Neverland being the we don't have to ever do anything, and everything's fine. And Nether, where we've lost complete control, and nothing is good. Nothing is good in the Nether world. Or nothing nether- is good in the Nether world uh, because we are in darkness. We're not in utopia where the sun shines and the ponies jump and the bubble gum is chewed. You know, you know who's in, in the darkness. In darkness right now is every single person who's writing articles about AI at this moment. You think they're in darkness? darkness? Yeah, they're in darkness. I, I know we're not going to do the AI AF podcast until next week, but the research I've been doing over the last week has taken me down so many um, wrong turns. Like you know, like you, you drive down the street and you're like, oh, I know where I'm going. I'm going to take a wrong turn like a dark alley. It's a dead end. I've been hitting dark alley dead ends on research for the last week and a half. Like you wouldn't believe, dude. You wouldn't believe. So no, no nobody's dead. able to cite anything. I think uh, it's difficult, man. It's, uh, it's just, no one knows what to expect. And not, we've never been through like any of this stuff before. So it's difficult to know what. Well, the only reason okay. it's difficult is because people keep making it difficult. It's it's in effect a very simple, I mean, technology-wise, it's been around for a very long time. It's not a complicated thing. It's just that the only way to make it present and to keep it present is to make it complicated. Right. Okay. Which is okay. it's a baffling equation. I I don't I don't really get, but um we'll do our best to capture that when we get to our next episode of AIAF. Um which will be next week. Um, but I'm Nate McBride. With me, as always, is my wonderful, enigmatic co-host, Mike Crispin, a.k.a. Crispo. Hey. Good to see everyone again or or to, to be on the podcast again. Each week, we do our best to bring you a new take on what it's like to be an IT leader and basically how to survive out there. Um, I mean, AI, AI notwithstanding... The world's getting a little bit weird in a lot of places, um, technology-wise, right now. Um, we'll talk about this in a bit, but you know, you know who's got to make a big decision in the next couple of weeks? Who's got to get up to the altar and and find a bride or a groom, as it were? Is Apple? Yeah, Apple. Uh, Apple's got to find a partner for AI. And they're not going to do it by themselves because that's not their sort of mo. So, but but we'll we'll come to that in a moment. Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's something we should definitely talk about. Yeah. Also, Bitcoin hitting seventy thousand dollars. I mean, oh my god. Very happy about um, that. Yeah. So last week, though, we did our first podcast uh, of the AIAF podcast. We did our first episode, which I thought went really well. Um, it was more like an episode within an episode. Sure. So if you're looking for us to do sort of a separate podcast, um, we just felt it was probably like more along the lines of what we do to take the current podcast and just sort of add a whole chapter at the end. So if you know how, I mean, if you, whatever platform you're on, you'll see that the podcasts are always divided up into chapters. Um, the last chapter of last week's podcast is AIAF. And there's really no easy way to describe how this works other than say that if you just kind of like hit the fast forward button a few times, you'll get to that last chapter. If, if we accumulate a lot of these and, and it starts to make sense, well, we will cut it out into a separate podcast, but for now, we're just going to kind of like loop that in, in the backs of these episodes, um, when it makes sense to do so. So it totally makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Again, not to beat a dead horse here, but 
I've been aggregating news stories over the last, I don't know, 10 days, um, trying to tie the threads of AI nonsense together. I mean, tech accord aside and how sort of the people on the tech accord are flagrantly effectively violating the, the accord they just signed. Um, you know, we've been saying this, Mike, for three months now. It's all about revenue. It will only ever be about, be about revenue. There's nothing good that's going to come out of this other than making people really rich. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't know if I agree with that, but I'll, I'll go with it for now. All right. Well, give me the counterpoint. I think well, black and tan I, here anyway. I think, I, I think there's, it's revenue, but I also think that a lot of tools and technology we've had have made money and have been all about revenue and have helped people build better things. So, I mean, well, I think, um, we're using zoom right now. It's for profit. It connected people during COVID with a click of a mouse button. It saved IT departments. For it's profit. Technology, yeah. But it's for revenue. I, I would I, I think there's probably more things that are free that no one has ever used or seen um, than the things that have been commercially available or have been repackaged that were free before that are made accessible and easier to use. And I think that with, you know, as much as chatbots are, sort of sort of boring in some respects they're becoming a um, kind of a consumer driven expectation that you can talk to something and it will give you an answer just type to something and it will give you an answer um whether it's useful or not you know to people if if, if people are not really technologists who are asking for it then they there must be some there must be some value for them I think a grammar you're, you're making well. the argument on behalf of the people making the revenue I mean I'm still waiting for an argument to be made where what is the issue with making revenue? There's no issue with that. It's just that. But why is it? But you just said nothing. Because we're, 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 everyone continues to look at, at, and not everyone sort of. Let me take that back. I don't have data to support that 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 uh, statement. But no. it seems that based on everything that you can read in the popular media and in even the less popular media, no. that people are expecting AI to somehow transform in oh, a sure. po in a positive way industry, when in fact it continues. Oh, yeah. The, the the people that will actually benefit from this continue to be a smaller and smaller group. I mean, just look at what happened with uh, Microsoft hiring the DeepMind uh, lead as sure, their sure. new head of AI. Uh, yeah. there's, there's a constriction. I mean, it's consolidating, not expanding, right? So it seems like it's expanding, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's also consolidating. So the people that will actually end up making the money, and that was a terrible poor. Um, I, know, I totally hear you. I think there's some big companies that are going to make a lot of money off of it. Um, I think there are other companies that will be created because of it. And that will that will create greater good for a lot of things. Um, we talked last week a little bit about people that might build technologies to help regulate AI that don't even exist that we can't even think about right now or understand. Um, you know, we've got robotics and those type of things that are coming that could pose positive and negative things. Um, this is just the baseline enabler for some of the things to come. That's the way I see it. Isn't it's not so much that it's a um, you know just kind of really only for revenue, but it's also for sort of innovation and growth. Um, and because it is so overhyped, I think in terms of it's just the name and whatever it's being in the press and whatnot is that even if it's not really AI, it's going to be said, we're going to say it's AI. <laughs> so no, I, not, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, yeah. just there was a, there was a, we went from having LLMs to yep. SLMs and VLMs. And now we're talking about people who are developing um, essentially uh, frugal GPT. Actually, there's a new one called frugal GPT. Yep. which is designed to go out and search and shop for the best GPT to run your query on. Yep. And then of course return you the, the, the quickest answer and the smallest transactional hit. And that to me is it's just one of the things that sort of crosses over into the absurd, right? We're at the point now where I'm going to go ahead and spend so much money. I need to actually use a service to give me an economy size. And this goes back to our point of last week, if I'm going to go ahead and not use the biggest possible weapon to um, or or thing at my disposal to find an answer, I'm going to get a lesser answer uh, mm -hmm. ultimately. So again, it's uh, there'll be a group of people, and we should probably yeah. get off this.
the soapbox. So there's good people that will uh, uh, gain tremendous advantage over the use of um, AI as it comes to evolve. And then there'll be the rest of us who are mostly disenfranchised from having access to that set, set of data. And it hasn't presented itself clearly yet, but I mean, there's examples of this happening all over the place now where people are saying, hey, listen, maybe you can't use uh, the big AI engines and that's okay. Here's a lesser one you can use. And yeah. it's it's being offered as a public service when in fact it's being it's masked as a um but the way I'm understanding it is a lot of the bigger models, the ones that are top of the line that cost a ton a, a ton you know to use right now, you know can take in bigger pieces of data and information and can do more with larger data sets. And the question I think in my mind is the general use case for the kind of the general population is you know right now if you want to make great photos or great videos you got to buy final cut or you got to go to class to learn final cut or adobe premiere or anything else yep. it's no different than than that um you want to use the big model and you want to put an encyclopedia in and digest it and create a, you know multiple books or multiple sets of data and have ai conjure up some sort of output for you you're going to need to pay for the compute power. I don't disagree with any of that, but the point is, Mike, that this is becoming um, a consumer affecting um, concept. So not everybody will be able to afford to get the best answers. Not everyone can afford Final Cut Pro, of course. So no. people make do with like snag it. Like that's what I use for my video editing and or, or iMovie. So are we, are we saying that the type of data that, um, anybody who has general access to a search engine today, let's say in the future, when they can access a chat bot or some other mechanism that because they'll be getting shorter responses that they, they may not get the full, the, the correct data. Uh, I don't want to equate shorter to less, um, uh, less good, I guess well, I want well, to equate, I want to equate, I want to equate the two as being, um, less of an answer. Let's just, let's just say that sure. way. Like, my, my my thesis is largely based on the fact that if if you're um, a certain type of person, then within the next few years, your access to data will become limited by virtue of your capability of accessing um, larger or more important data. That's you all. don't think that that ads will be inserted or there won't be any monetization or loss of oh privacy. Oh my God! Or... Don't even get me started. Like once. But you'll still have access to the data, is what I'm saying. You, you might, know. you might to a point, but then what you'll have, what you'll be be besieged with, is a cycle of dis be a cycle of disinformation that could be catastrophic. And I mean, in terms of like um, existential threats, and again, we are way off the sort of topic. But in terms no, of threats, I think that it's less about whether or not AI could like launch a nuclear war or something and more about whether or not somebody will be able to actually get information that they need or not. I and that, that becoming a class-based effect. Um, I mean, Saudi Arabia is about to put $40 billion into AI research in their country. Uh, where do you think that's going to go? And I'm not, you don't have to answer that right now, but if you really think oh. about Saudi Arabia's um, policies towards class, uh, caste, gender, et cetera, we, sure. well, we, we run into, we run into a world where a decade from now, a lot of people won't have any more inf access to information that they need. It'll be, it'll be curated. And this has already been happening in Asia. Pac. Sure. I, I would argue it happens now um, without AI. So you're right. I mean, there's definitely, and the question is, is that whether or not someone creates AI that that combats that, right? And that I think without without that exploration, there isn't a let's kind of was talking about those governance models before. It's also the there will be there will be investment, I think, in AI that to to bring different uh, languages forward and, and models forward. I think a lot of AI language models don't even know what it's going to say. Yeah. So for it to be, and this is why the whole Google thing is, to me, a Gemini issue that they had is more of a technical screw up than a, you know, kind of cultural or ideals that Google set up, uh, screw up. But it's, 
they don't even really know what these things are doing. I think that's the scariest thing is they really don't know what these things, how these things are getting answers. <laughs> so, they're, getting close, they're getting closer to that point yeah. of being able to determine how they get an answer. I mean, they're getting, well, especially on the rag side, they're getting good accuracy in terms of being able to predict what kind of answer might come out. But um, yeah, again, Mike, it's uh, we're coming to a point in time where like, I don't feel like I'm getting suppressed information, but I'm also, um, I'm reading the same things over and over and over again from different yeah. people. So I'm wondering how it's being created. Uh, there was a huge um, article that came out I think, two days ago about how many scientific journals have been released in the last two months that were AI generated, though purported to be done by an actual human. And these things can be found out now, right? We can know these things. Yeah, we can. That's, that's, that's fine. Yeah. terrifying. Yeah, that, definitely. That, but the, these articles, just because they're submitted and then ultimately exposed, doesn't mean that they leave the sort of popular canon for that, you know, disease state or that level of research. They, they exist. And therefore, like, <laughs> like WebMD. Oh, yeah. I, got, I got a soreness in my neck and my mouth is dry. You're going to die. I was WebMD, right? Like, Web M well, WebMD said. <laughs> yeah, WebMD said. So now it's going to be like, well, right. look, I found this research article right here that says uh, when your left hand goes numb, you're going to die. And yeah. and there will be groups. <laughs> there will be groups in the world, especially in the United States, that take this misinformation as, as truth. Mm -hmm. And there'll be like, the I'm just telling you right now. The the lengths I have to go to to verify a source now, it's unbelievable, it's, right? It's absurd. How do you? I go, I go to Reuters and Reuters says go to Bloomberg. I go to Bloomberg and Bloomberg says go to the the AP. I go to the AP. I can't find anyone's names. I can't find this. Like I can't exactly, find exactly, man. I, I'm with you. <laughs> so, I think I, that's what I mean. I'm just like, making the news. Wouldn't it be better if there was just some artificial thing that just told us what to do? I'm just kidding. I'm uh, joking. But that's that's the whole point, right? Is we don't know now. We we just have to trust sources, right? And um, very so hard sources. to know who the experts are anymore, right? So, so it's like so. And this a, is, a question we can answer. But we're talking about stuff that hasn't happened yet, you know. We can't, but we can. I mean, we're smart enough to theorize. But a question we should answer at some point in time is, and not tonight, but um, how much <laughs> how much trust will you put in AI? And and will it change over time? I mean, again, assuming that AI is an entropic sort of effect, right? Like, like the nature of data and AI will continually degrade. How much trust will you put in it over time as this source of truth? And again, we'll oh, sorry, sure. about, let's not answer that tonight because we actually have a actual podcast to get to. Yeah, let, we can, let's jump in. There's plenty of uh, time yeah. for us to talk well, about. I did want to, so completely changing topics. We do have an actual sponsor now. I can't believe it. So Luminaries Forge is our new show sponsor. Um, and now it's no coincidence that I run Luminaries Forge, but I'm going to go ahead and do a shout out to myself, the sponsor of the show. So, awesome. Thank yeah. you, Luminaries Forge. Thank you, Luminaries. So Luminaries Forge is an immersive nine-month program focused entirely on developing IT leadership for the next generation of IT superstars. And I think you know this. Um, it's in leadership and technical training, one size does not fit all. I'm in currently in a class right now at a large institution that's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's been an eight-month class. Um, it costs about nearly $30,000. And it's been the biggest, I would say, waste of my time I've ever encountered in terms of education. And um, I'm astonished at the fact that this organization can get away with this. But unlike that program, uh, which has a cohort of 50 people from all over the globe who um, have no sort of concept of um, like the fact that they're being ripped off. Luminaries Forge limits its cohorts to just 10 future luminaries. This intentional choice is the cornerstone of the success and growth um, uh, for several compelling reasons. One, the Luminaries Forge approach um, is optimized for comprehension and retention. So with only 10 future luminaries per cohort, every question is an opportunity for everyone to learn and no voice goes unheard. Uh, a smaller class leads to meaningful discussions. 
without the cacophony of crowded lecture halls where you have to yell to be heard. And I trust me, I know this is true. Um, in the classes that I'm in right now, you can't get your questions answered. You, for all this money that you pay and you can email a professor, they're like, oh yeah, just email the professor. Email a professor, a week later, you get back an answer from the professor's TA, which has nothing to do with the question you actually asked. Rather than a static one directional lecture with ind different professors, the programs at Luminaries Forge are agile, adapting to the cohort's pace and interests, which leads to a more relevant and impactful learning experience. There's a tremendous network. Students will build a lasting connections with a tight knit group of like minded professionals, like minded professionals, and recognized IT experts. The bonds formed in small groups often translate into a robust professional network that supports careers long after the program concludes. So head over to luminariesforge.com now to take a look at the program. The next cohort begins on July 1. Registration is now open. I have a tremendous faculty lined up for this class or for this cohort. Um, everything from a CFO of a major robotics corporation, um, an amazing uh, executive presence and speaking coach, um, a top CISO, and not not to mention several others who will be joining our classes and um, bringing back sort of real world examples for these luminaries to use back in their corporations. So there you go, an actual sponsor. We have a sponsor. We are making money effectively. We have now have revenue for the podcast. I'm very happy about that. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Great news, man. Great news. Yeah, it's great news. Um, and so for those listening, if you want to continue the conversations on our show or deep dive into everything else that we talk about, come find us and let us know. You can find the link to join our Discord server in the show notes, as well as on our website, thecoit.us. I also want to mention that if you do like our show, please give us five stars on Apple Podcast or Spotify or YouTube or wherever you listen to the show. Also, in our show description, we have links to buy our to us to our buy a buy us a beer portal. Oh my God, that was terrible to say. And our <laughs> merchandise store, which is growing every week, we're constantly adding new new things to our merchandise store. We have some awesome shirts. In fact, I'll be going to Pax East tomorrow and Friday and wearing my AIAF shirts. So um, that'll be awesome. And of course, putting stickers everywhere. Um, Last term up, baby. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, Mike, we're still on the EX journey. We're still on the employee experience journey right now. Yep. And employee experience does not just concern itself with onboarding and offboarding. There's a whole like exactly middle part, you know, the fluff and the nutter. The journey. Uh, the journey. So as part of that, tonight we'll be discussing training and education, which is the next chapter in the new IT leader survival guide. Uh, now, I want to clarify one thing. I say next chapter because if we go by the life sciences IT leader survival guide, it would be chapter 18. However, next week I'm about to release a massively updated and overhauled version of the book uh, entitled the new IT leader survival guide. And in that book, it's chapter 21. So if you're listening to the podcast and you're you're following along in the Life Sciences IT Survival Guide, this is chapter 18 we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about performance assessments. And I will admit, that is definitely a part of EX, but it's more so from like an overall GNA perspective. Uh, but it us from tying it back together. And then as a reminder, Mike and I will be crashing BioIT world. Actually, it's not crashing. I do now have a pass. Um, Mike's working on a pass. Mike's trying to find a sugar daddy uh, to get him a pass. I have one, but I have to I have to speak for them, which I'm, I'm okay with. But I got a pass. Uh, so mark your calendars for BioIT world in Boston on April 16th and 17th. And even if you're just in Boston, you're not going to that, just let us know and we'll find a bar and we'll just turn on the microphones and capture it. Um, Mike, anything you want to make note of? No, this has been an exciting, uh, exciting week. I just got back from Atlanta. I was away for a few days and uh, I'm glad to be back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I, I got to go off and, you know, get jury duty this week. So I've got to prepare for that. Hopefully I'll be back for next one. Good citizen, Mike. 
<laughs> doing your civic duties. It's a, hey, happy to do it. Happy to do it. But you just never know how long that's going to go on if you get in. So I ha- I'm having black and tans tonight, although I forgot my, forgot my spoon to just properly mix them. But um, I haven't had one in years and I have one on St. Patty's Day. Oh, yeah. So I would... Properly made black and tan. It's actually a pretty exceptional, exceptional drink. Um, although I'm using Switchback Ale and Guinness, which really don't go well together, but we're going to make it work. Oh, uh, I forgot to mention that um, tomorrow or Friday, TBD, will be dropping a bonus episode on the podcast. The awesome folks over at Swear, S-W-A-R-E, gave me the recording of the panel we had on the Next Generation Validation. So for all of you life sciences IT nerds out there, You'll want to take a listen to that. It's really good a discussion. Very so, cool. all right, let's get to the question on Apple and its future dance partner for um, AI. So, sure. so again, back to Reuters, Bloomberg, AP, the circle of of um, the the vortex of, of the toilet, the eddy, if you will. Uh, I I wasn't able to really substantiate most of this, but I kind of put together the parts that I thought thought were most factual. But anyway, so Apple's in talks to build Google's Gemini AI engine into the iPhone. Bloomberg reported on Monday, citing people familiar with the situation. Okay, so that's that's my some one citation. The negotiations are about licensing Gemini for some new features coming to the iPhone software this year, the report said, adding that the terms or branding of an AI agreement or how it would be implemented have not been decided. It's likely, unlikely that any deal will be announced until June when Apple plans to hold its annual conference of developers and the iPhone maker also recently held talks with the chat GPT maker OpenAI about using its model, according to the same report. Neither Google or OpenAI responded to Reuters request for comment. <laughs> so, um, so a potential deal between the firms could help Google expand the use of its AI services to more than 2 billion active Apple devices boosting the search giant's efforts to catch up with Microsoft. It all, could also help allay investor fears about the slow rollout of AI apps by Apple, which has lost the crown of the world's most valuable firm after a 10% decline in its shares this year. Oof. So the firms have a years-long partnership that makes Google the default search engine on Apple's Safari web browser and a Gen AI t- tie-up that may help Alphabet the Alphabet unit navigate fears that services like ChatGPT could threaten its search dominance. But, of course, the agreement could also invite sharper scrutiny from U.S. regulators who have sued Google numerous times yep. on all kinds of anti-monopoly grounds. That's my own sort of version of that paragraph. <laughs> the uh, This strategic partnership is a missing piece in the Apple AI strategy and combines forces with Google Gemini to power some of the AI features Apple's bringing to market to Daniel Ives, an analyst at Wedbush. All right, so Wedbush gets a nod in that article, apparently. Um, yon, yon, yon. Uh, so Apple CEO Tim Cook said last month that the company was investing significantly in, in air quotes in generative AI and would reveal more about its plans to put the technology to use later this year. Lastly, the Bloomberg report said Apple was planning to use its own homegrown AI models for some new capabilities in its upcoming iOS 18, but was seeking a partner to power Gen AI features, including functions for creating images and writing essays based on single prompts. So that whole whole last paragraph there has a whole bunch of head scratching shit in it, but I'll ask you this question, Mike, who do you think wins? Who do you think goes to bed with Apple? I think think it's a good possibility they do deals with both. And that um, way to pick a side. Well, I think that think of what Samsung has done. They have both on their phone, right? I mean, there's there's certainly Google aspects um, that are built into Samsung, and it's Android, obviously, which is help makes it closer. But I don't know. It's tough. I I I think at least the noise online has been that people are concerned about privacy. And Google and Apple supposedly a privacy company, and to put Google in the the center of the phone to do all the AI or Gen AI stuff is giving people some pause. 
even people are like, I'm switching to Android. It's like, whoa, wait, <laughs> that doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know? Um, but um, I, the answer is I don't know fully because I think that the on-device stuff will be de developed by Apple. I think um, it's also possible that Google is working on building a, a more a better mobile version of search that incorporates Gemini that will ride along and be licensed by Apple and will be available on Android as it kind of is already. Yeah. Um, so it depends on what the source is. I mean, really, Mark Gurman, the, the, the writer from uh, Bloomberg, is one of the better Apple columnists who has a lot of the inside track. So for it to come from him means there's probably some some validity to it as to what it's being used for. I doubt Apple goes up and says, we're using Google Gemini. They'll call it Siri and it'll be Siri and it just be being fed by Google or by OpenAI or by whoever else. Yeah. Uh, but whatever they do to fix Siri, that'll be a good thing. Um, but I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to be a, there's people have said like Apple will make it pretty clear that it's Google so they can hold Google accountable when AI screws up. Yeah. There are others that say, um, it'll be completely invisible and in that it's just going to be sourced via an API and that it will look like it's Apple's stuff, you know, and it won't even be, it'll be pretty transparent. And I, I lean towards the latter because I do think Apple has some internal uh, gen AI work at, at, at hand. It's not up to speed with the comp competition, but when it is, I think they're going to want to kind of switch it over. Uh, and they probably will never tell us that they are. <laughs> we'll just it'll just start working on their on their machines. It'll be load balanced on their their systems over time. That that's sort of what I think. So that's why yeah. I don't think there's someone who's really gonna get the the value. Uh, Google Google pays Apple to use Google Search right now. Will they pay Apple to use Gemini? It's really interesting to see what that. It's not really Google who. When, it, when it's Apple, some would argue that Apple needs Gemini because they're not going to be able to keep up with everyone else if they don't have that. So who needs who the most here? And we'll see yeah. how it pans out. That, um, remember that discussion we had on the loss of autonomy back in like episode seven? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Two weeks ago, yeah. I think this sort of furthers that that issue where I mean, unless you want to go find an old BlackBerry, you're really going to be coming down to the choice of OS the choice of OS will be largely determined by, well, not largely determined by, but will require that you subscribe to one particular AI engine or another. You're you're going to be sort of funneled into a decision point for what you can do to get answers. I you think there's a debate. Or... I, I don't necessarily agree with it. I, I think I agree with, I, I agree with the app store methodology that that could be a risk, um, but we haven't seen it yet from Apple. Like for example, if you know, we didn't talk about TikTok last week, but if if something like gets pulled from the App Store and on an Apple phone, yeah. you're not getting it. You're just not going to get it. And TikTok's a bad example because it'll it could be banned pretty much from every store or it could be made illegal to download or whatever if that's what happens. But if you look at the iPhone, if if let's say there's an app that you really like, one of those was Fortnite for a lot of people. Yeah. Apple doesn't agree with the way that it's being sold. So they take it off the app store, which they have every right to do. But you as a consumer, as a user, you don't have any choice but to go use something else. And um, the same, I don't think, I do not think the same is true with AI where they could, Apple could really be the bad guy and say, you can't use chat gpt we're going to block it from the app store they would never do that i'm not sure i would go so far i mean i understand your point i wouldn't go so far as to say that they would block competitor ai engines what i'm saying oh, is i don't that... think they would but that's the analogy i'm using against uh, against these ai engines you can go and get them on the open web um pretty easily and if you're if you're on android these things will be available pretty Maybe even for free in some some markets. But if you're using, I mean, if you're going to go ahead and select an OS, like if you're going to select Windows 11 or Windows 12, yep, as your OS, you have to deal with the fact that there's now an integrated AI agent into yes. your world. Like you can't escape that fact. Well, we're not obviously too far down the road from that happening within sort of a 
a Mac OS, iOS perspective as well. And so again, loss of autonomy means that you have to subscribe to, like you could, it doesn't mean you can't use. You have to take an extra step. You have to take an extra step. And I think that's, that's, um, I, I totally agree with you. What What is one click away versus six clicks away? 90% of people are going to use the one that's one click away and you're never going to think twice and you yeah. might get a certain engine because of that. Um, and that's the case with iMessage, right? I mean, that's why iMessage is so popular. I don't want to install another chat application. Everyone's already on iMessage. And When is uh, WWDC, by the way, do you know? June? Uh, it's June. It hasn't been officially announced, but it's usually June 5th. Uh, oh. That's impossible to get into, but that's one I would love to go to. So we'll revisit this um, topic after WWDC. I'm sure there will be a short answer. So, um, all right. Thanks for humoring me on that topic. Um, I don't even, that's, that's the other thing. You know, you're talking about verifying sources. I, I, I have a hard time believing that it's a big part of the story. I think it's probably they're using it for one or two little features. Maybe maybe they want to yeah. use numbers and, and they're, they want to have better, you know, generation and they're going to use Gemini to do that. And it has nothing to do with Siri. I mean, we it, don't it, even know. Yeah, you know there's... what I wish I had the time to do would be to collate just the headlines of the last week into one sort of headline de debrief. And you can watch, uh, we're basically like full on spasms by the news media on how to deal with everything. Um, they're just having like apoplectic fits over what to actually use as headlines for news. It's, uh, well, I mean, look at NVIDIA's updates this week, right? I mean, yeah. that that that's probably the biggest AI story of the week. What they just they just basically announced a whole platform ecosystem set of yeah. chips, robotics. And they got Biden involved, and now it's going to become like it's going to become a um, a political issue. I'm um, for for sure. I mean, it's a big deal. Like this this whole idea of chip manufacturing in the United States is going to become such a oh, all right listen let's uh have to yeah, yeah let's, I got you. let's stay on let's stay on brand here for a minute um sure. well for the rest of the podcast anyway <laughs> <laughs> no, um, this is stuff we're passionate about definitely i i get you i i hear what you're saying um all right so wwdc let's we'll, we'll revisit this in june and next week when we talk about ai we will cover the what's happening with intel and its competitors because it's fascinating um, all right, so on to the topic at hand. Uh, I'm not gonna let you off the hook with questions because I do have a trifecta for you tonight in terms of the opener. I know yeah. you're you're recalibrating from the big meeting you just had for your company, plus I just threw a whole bunch of AI shit at you. Sure, uh, go for it. And you're also scrambling for your first your lieutenant's coming in Monday, your new hire, your Love first it. hire. Oh, um, literally, I'm sure you've consulted the new leader IT survival guide dozens of times. Absolutely. So, by the way, how stoked are you? I mean, to have a lieutenant. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. There's a lot of a lot of things that we need to do, and uh, it'll be good to have a, a peer and someone to to bounce ideas off of. And you have and the best. It'll be it'll be good, and looking forward to it. And can't come soon enough. We're very excited. Good stuff. Well, we'll have to we'll have to hear all about it uh, next time we 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 catch up. Um, I want to hit I want to hit you with a few questions. Sure. Um, so we talked about this a bit last week, but um, we're talking about training and education tonight. That's the 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 topic of the night, and I wanted to get your take on on question number one. What's your take on um, the differences between the training required for Gen X, Gen Z, and Gen Alpha? Yeah, everyone learns differently, right? So it's having to create the right mediums and approaches. Um, I I find that I mean Gen Z is still was still a little somewhat early there, but they they don't require as as much training. It's more they're teaching us stuff and um, finding things out. You know, it really works well with Gen Z that that I'm finding, and even to some extent, um, sort of the 
the the millennials and whatnot is letting them answer questions, getting a crowdsource model up, letting them yeah, talk, it's awesome. be champions for yep. a lot of things that we're doing. Um, of course, if you're putting in technologies that are 20 years old and you know they they don't have a lot of the capabilities that those type of users may expect, then you're going to have a tough time training them, I think. And you've, you've got to try and get them molded into the business and to what you're using and show them the benefits of what you might have to offer. But if you're using a more modern tool set, they'll help you implement it, I think. That's at least what I have found. Um, if you've got a best of breed sort of software stack strategy they're they they, they want to help uh, and they want to be a part of it and they want to get the most out of it so they don't require as much training i think some will ask for it and you can send them a link and they'll go figure it out that's pretty that's pretty easy i like that um okay. others i think it's 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 more around um use cases business use cases right um, and this, I'd say Gen X and sort of the millennials uh, as well. What do you do every day? I do X. Well, here's how you would use tool Y uh, in in that in that X situation. You know, let's go through that uh, day in the life and use this tool to get that job done so that it resonates with them and they may use it repetitively so they don't need to be trained again. So it's going to apply to their business uh, process, business use case. Yep. And try and show them that. And that could be in a training setting. It can be in a lunch and learn. It can be in documentation or in a short Zoom meeting or video or whatnot. I, I think that that works well. Um, and then I think for just overall, you know, having a searchable knowledge base is really important. Though I, you know, it's just, it's more of a, I want to put it. Who's nice. more likely to use the knowledge base? Do you think? It's a, yeah, it's a CYA. Yeah. Because a lot of people, I can't say how many people are like, well, you should do a lunch and learn, or do you have links posted on, or could you send instructions? Like, well, yes, we have posted them. Here's where they are. We have sent around emails. We've done, oh, I didn't have time. Sorry, I missed that. And so all the work you do to create documentation and stuff, if it's not readily available for them and it doesn't show up when they need it, it's, it's just going to be an archive. So I still think that lunch and learns are very good. For across all groups if people can't make it oh let's record it they're never going to watch it but let's record it and just so we got it uh again cya so we do have the data available to you if you have the time to watch it and, and see it yep. you need that human interaction with a lot of the groups to show them how to learn and or show them how, how to learn the technologies and actually be hands-on with it and do it um so there's a there's a lot there but I think being in person, being able to answer questions, whether it be on Zoom or in person, um, and 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 having the feedback loop we talked about in like episode one or two, is really important for post training, to make to continue to um, enrich the training as you as you give it more and more uh, over time. Hopefully, more the more of the tools you implement don't require as much training. Yeah. Um, the base use cases of them are pretty usable without training. Right, right. So I'm changing the, you know, where I am right now, I'm moving away from some very common tools. And that requires, you know, a, a, more, more more training. Not, I wouldn't say training as much as it is being available to answer questions on the fly. Yeah. Having a Slack channel that's crowdsourced and open for other people to answer questions besides IT. Um, and that shows engagement and it shows people who are plugged in and already working on the tool and helping others to get on board. Yeah. But if you're using the tools that you're switching to, to train, then it's, they're using that tool every day to, 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 to work. So business use cases are key. Uh, and on the Gen Z side, a lot of times they're going to help you with that. <laughs> if you want them to help, they will. Well, I mean, and Gen Alpha too is sort of sitting out there. I mean, they they are making their way into the, the corporations now. Yep. And um, I mean, I'm not going to sort of put a blanket of understanding over them, but the Gen A's that I've come across typically know um, the majority of what you're doing. They only require training in the most specific outliers, not in the general sort of understanding of how data works. 
they don't have sort of the training on how to actually be in a company, but they have the training of um, every tool that you could probably throw at them that's collaborative, uh, asynchronous, et cetera. They, they've got it. They've got the general principle, um, which yes. is key. So I think you probably already answered my second question to a degree, but in terms of trust, um, how does that play a role in training? And let me just sort of edify that by saying, if I think about, okay, I'm going to trust these 10 people how to use Box Drive after my training. I, I, I'm training 10 people on how to use Box Drive, right? It's a 30 minute class. And I have to, in my mind, think how many of these 10 uh, do I trust to go off and do everything I just said? Like I, I'm, I'm applying a trust model to them saying, okay, well, I think at least seven got this. Three, I'm not so sure about. They looked like a little clueless on the on the Zoom. They didn't have any questions for me. Like how much does trust come into training for you? Like how much, are you just implicitly assuming that everyone that attends your training understands or are you doing particular follow-ups with certain people like yeah the second it's follow-ups trying to follow up the with the people we think may have trouble grasping it um and where do they most likely fall in terms of i i i think it, it depends on the tool if you if you are training on something that they are going to use every day um the the, the, the room's going to be full so if you're if you're putting something that in that is um they they a they have to use because maybe something is being shut right. down and they're going to have to learn i i think i i trust them i'd say more than the much more than the majority of people that they're they are have a vested interest in learning how to do it and will go back and and learn learn how to use it if it's a app business line application uh that they have to use twice a year i'm incredibly worried i'm incredibly worried yeah i don't even know if there's value in training them in some respects, because when the day comes that they have to use the tool, there's too many other things going on in their world to remember or to go back to their notebook. And unfortunately, a lot of business line applications, they're still not easy to use. And they're going to call. That's an awesome point. Help. They're going to call and ask for help anyway. What I, I, you probably know the answer to this, but I'll go ahead and answer it for you. So annual, annually, when it's time to redo benefits. Yep. <laughs> what do what's the number one help desk ticket you're going to get for that entire month it's going to be how do i use xyz benefits portal how do i log in how do yep. i access my account uh i don't know what to do because it's an annual event yep so that into your train like you have to decide what you want to train people on and where the value is no, if it's a compliance system, you got to train them, right? You got to train them regardless. If it's GXP okay. or Part 11, you got to train them or Sovereign's Oxley scoped system or whatnot. Absolutely. Got it. I got to give big props to all the HR departments who every single year dread December, November, and they're just like, <laughs> here it comes. Here it comes the, the thousand questions of how to get anything. And, and they, they like, at Exilio, uh, HR does a training. Like, hey, yep. we know benefits is coming up. We're offering these trainings, and they get like two people come in. <laughs> Everyone else thinks they, that they have it until they try to log in, right? Um, yeah. So the the trust part, the trust part from an IT outward perspective, I think it's huge internally. I think the more that you're you do trainings and that people find they're successful, they're more apt to put trust back in you, IT to deliver the goods every time that you train. Um, now, the last question I had for you before we get into the chapter read was about manager training. And yep. I mean this from a two-part perspective. One, should, should we be training managers to train their staff? Um, and two, if you train a manager to do like a managerial task, is the assumption in terms of EX, that is, in terms of the employee, employee experience, is the assumption that by training a manager, there's sort of a, a trickle down effect or is manager training, I mean, it's like the secret key to EX or is it completely, am I completely off the mark? I mean, managers are just people too. The great concept, I mean, to, to, to train, like have a multi-level training that you're empowering managers to 
run and and own and help champion the system's success, but also to actually manage a part of it as well, um, or to have a certain level of data access that requires a different level of training. Um, I think it's all very relevant, but it's a separate training, uh, separate training course. And those are the ones that there needs to be a sign off. There needs to be a, sort of an understanding that the training has been completed, uh, read and understood, you know, that good stuff. Um, when you start talking about managers, now, if they're going to train on their own, um, I don't want to think of this. got to have a, a, a specific syllabus that they need to drive with and, and follow that needs to be continuously updated it is my opinion just got it because that i i, I get stuck I on this hair and feeding they're stuck on this idea a lot in terms of okay and this goes back to trust which goes back to the generations like i'm going to train this manager how to do a thing should I just immediately assume that they're not going to go ahead and train their staff and then train their staff too? Or like, what, where's my responsibility in saying, I've trained you, they're your direct reports, you should now go and train them, or is all the training now on me? Like, is it, I mean, which is fine. Like, I'm not saying I shouldn't be responsible for training everybody on a technology. Historically, for me, Nate, I've, I have not tried that i've always brought pulled it back to it for every direct every direct yeah person. Sure. just so that the so that to take the sort of the support element off of the manager if there's an issue um because i think a lot of times what's going to happen is the manager's not available to answer a question they've got other things they need to accomplish or get done wow. and to send them to the service desk or whatnot is part of our job and all that good you're stuff. You're getting into the EX part though, which is again, I don't want to get too off the rails, but we we tend to do that anyway. So what the hell? Um, if you train a manager and they train their staff, the staff should then be able to go get support not from the manager, like the staff should get support from the EX central paradigm. Um, yeah. And and by doing this, are you improving EX or not improving EX? Are you effectively um, kicking the can down the road by by doing that versus just training everybody. I mean, it's it's maybe a question that can't be answered, so to speak. It's something I've thought about a lot, um, especially when I I lean on managers to help IT with with very specific types of like technology that only affects their group. Yep. I'm saying like, hey, listen, you you bought this platform for your team and you just keep throwing over the fact that you don't know anything about the platform to it. Let me train you on that thing so you can know it. And then we'll either I will train or you will train your people. That way you can just stop having to ask about the platform. If the platform is owned by the business, uh, the business function, I don't know that it should, and they should know the system, but they shouldn't be training People. But okay, but uh, I'll play devil's advocate because I now I agree with you. But devil's advocate then is something that we encounter, which is, um, put in platform X Y Z. Yep. They get trained trained by the vendor on it. Then uh, three months later, they go hire a new employee to come in. Yep. The new employee is looking at this thing, saying, "No idea." Tickets start coming in. Um, they who like. In terms of EX, that employee is having a shitty day. So you got to put they got to put you got to put the business owner as an agent in the service desk. They need to be taking all the tickets, one hundred percent. They get the ticket, not the IT group. It's in your now. The only responsibility IT has is to make sure they have an agent and a in a queue in the ticket system, and they. That's part of the implementation plan from a total cost perspective. Is if you know if that's if, if IT is going to support it, then we need to staff for it. And especially these business line applications where you may not have someone hired who knows it and you don't have the resource to send them the training because they're already supporting enough um, enough things. So the business, someone say, yeah, I, I want to put it in. I want to support it. 
I need to follow the IT governance model and the cybersecurity rules. Uh, but outside of that, I'm, we're going to support it and we're going to make sure, you know, we follow that. Me speaking as from the business perspective. Um, and you're going to work, I'm going to be an agent on your service desk for any ticket that comes in on the contract management system or the procurement system. Um, and it goes right to them. And we've, we've, we've done that before. It's still a partnership um, with, with the business lines and we do what we can to help, but largely IT, you know, multi-tier service, tier one service um, is IT supports SSO, cybersecurity and the IT standards. Um, helps with the MSA, the contract, you know, getting things in place. And then it's the support goes to the business technologist or the 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 business person who's running the system. Um, and there's a backup in IT. You know, if there's a, someone who leaves the company, you've got a backup um, that has access to the vendor and all that good stuff. But they become a uh, <laughs> they become an agent on the service desk. They've been part of the team so much. So um, so you can do that and centralize. And that's why a service desk platform, an enterprise service desk platform is um, becoming more and more valuable for companies because it's what's bridging the business and IT to to share the support burden and also to distribute the support burden out to the org without having to change the, the model and the workflow. All right. So let's close up this question by, let me ask you this last final piece, which is, um, everything that you just said has a direct impact on EX. Yep. So does IT ultimately become responsible for EX for any platform which the business functions need? In other words, if a business function goes out and buys a new ERP system, they get trained on it, you create an agent for it, but yet you're still IT. Yeah, you should be part of that discussion, that implementation discussion. Are Another you responsible for EX? Are you responsible for the end-to-end EX experience for that platform? End to end EX experience. Yeah. So, so like, from the time the new from the time a new employee gets hired, they get trained in the system. Yep. They are now they're now able to use it. Yep. Everything that happens with their entire role in that system mm -hmm. is IT responsible for it or is the functional line responsible for it? Functional from line is, is responsible for the EX once the user is created. Okay. Yeah, that would be my 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 thought on that, in that specific case. I would say yes, and where IT does come in is to provision the users based on the the policies and standards they have in place, and to deprovision the user. Uh, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but are you willing to concede then EX to back to the business, like a, a, a lapse in EX back yeah, to the business? Depends on that. Depends on the application and the and the tiering. There, there are more and more applications that have a great user experience uh, end to end that don't require IT okay. intervention. So no, I would say yeah, I t I completely tr I trust the business to do a lot of things if they're they have the resource and they're capable, um, and that's where we build the partnership and and having the they having that governance. You know, we talked about a couple of weeks ago is so important is that you you can if you're as ITs look to to provide guardrails to make sure that there's consistency. Um, doesn't mean that they just set it and walk away. They they set it and they help implement it. Um, but the actual application, like for example, let's take a contract management system. As a, let's say it has a lousy user experience. IT should be always be a part of that conversation when things are being implemented. If you have a good partnership with the, the business functions, they will want you there. Um, if they're going and buying things without talking to you, they're don't understand the value you'll provide, right? I think it's that's that's part of what we were talking about earlier. But partnership, getting connected with people, giving and taking in some some er some respects where things might not be perfect, but they're good enough. Um, you know, having to to sort of figure out what the low hanging fruit is versus the things that are going to create complexities and be hard to do. Um, so, I think. You know, if they think you're going to, you're going to slow them down, they're going to go around you. Uh, they shouldn't, but smaller companies that can happen a lot. But the fact they're picking up the call and they want you at the table is means that you should be able to help with that EX, whether you're in IT or you're in the business or you're in a different part of the organization. You should be able to have that voice and be able to help drive that conversation. Okay. Good. 
All right. Lots of food for thought. Um, so Perfect. we'll, let me dive into the chapter here yep. and we will um, take a look at this and then we can talk about just a few more questions after this chapter and yep. get your thoughts. But I think what I'm going to talk about in just a moment, we'll touch on a lot of these points that you just made. And I don't think I can change your mind necessarily. And I agree with you on so many points, but just think about as I'm going through this sort of, um, a, whether I'm right or wrong, but also um, sort of where, where the where the points make the most sense. And then we'll just reconvene in, in just a few minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. All right. All right. So so chapter 18 or or chapter 21, depending which version of the book you're reading, uh, training and education. Oh, can you give me the um, little intro? This is audible. All right. I don't know. It just somehow like gets me in the, in the right state of mind. Okay. Here we go. A substantial portion of what makes you so unique to the business is your ability to bring in new technologies that enable the business to achieve its goals. In the race to deploy new technologies that will hopefully fill gaps and propel business ideas, IT leaders often neglect or substantially deprioritize the necessary training that equips employees with the tools needed to use the technology itself. Oddly enough, Businesses commonly enable this behavior to gain quick access to their technology, eschewing the common sense approach to learning it inside and out before deploying it into production. When an executive asks why we need so much training for a new platform, I respond, you wouldn't just show up on a marathon day without training, would you? So <laughs> I would invest a quarter million dollars into a software platform without the training time needed to get the maximum value and yield the best possible result but let's not play, place all blame on the business. Even without pressure from the business, IT leaders can easily underestimate the amount of training needed for a seemingly innocuous new application, only to find later that their actual yield is a continuous stream of support tickets and customers who grow resentful towards the technology and ultimately end up not using it. This misalignment between technology implementation and training can hinder the achievement of business objectives as employees struggle to effectively utilize the tools meant to enhance productivity and drive growth. To secure buy-in and support from executives and managers, it is crucial to demonstrate how technology training directly supports attaining business goals. IT leaders can position themselves as strategic partners in driving organizational success by aligning training initiatives with the overall business objectives and strategies. This involves understanding the key performance indicators or KPIs and targets the business sets and designing training programs that enable employees to leverage technology to pursue these goals effectively. For example, suppose the business aims to increase sales revenue by 20%. In that case, technology training can focus on tools and platforms that streamline the sales process, improve customer relationship management and enable data-driven data decision-making. The shortest route to technological debt is the one that bypasses training. However, by prioritizing training and demonstrating its strategic value, IT leaders can avoid this pitfall and ensure the technology investments yield the desired returns. This proactive approach to training mitigates the risk of support issues and user frustration and positions IT as a critical enabler of business growth and success. We are not done with all the guilty parties though. Even if the business incorporates the training and IT does not skimp on their end of the bargain, we still have the end users. Oh yes, we wanna be in, honest about this. We need to recognize a very well-studied fact. Adults in the corporate world do not enjoy being trained. There's a footnote here with some links to some HBR articles, but in, summaration, in summarization, uh, adults don't like to do training. Obvious reasons for this include work loss perception, such as training takes time away from the mounting pressures of doing their day job. One hour of training means one hour that my email is piling up, work is not getting done, and I will have to work twice as hard to get over that hill. Poor trainers. Some people should never be allowed to train employees. This goes out to all you deck readers, and the rest of us can read too but especially to the droll and monotone vendor offered trainers or the employees who are press ganged into service and do not want to be there clearly. 
bad timing. The content is not relevant, or at least not relevant yet. If the person is not using the platform for another four weeks, why would you train them today? Training should be one of the final steps before deployment and use. And lastly, poor scheduling. Training always seems to be scheduled at the wrong times. Do not schedule to overlap with other significant corporate initiatives. Whatever you do, never schedule training after lunch. The problem is that most often, the sweet spot for training is about 9 to 11 a.m., which is also the sweet spot for work efficiency. So do your best to find a time that works for everyone. And a coffee helps too. Or free coffee, that is. But year one of your new leadership is not your last chance, but your best chance to deploy new educational dogma into the business. Before you start with the, oh, I have so many other things that are more important to do than training excuse, let me give you a big preemptive, don't even. I am not suggesting that you create the next Khan Academy in year one. Still, you do need to create a cultural shift in how people view the interplay of training and technology. These two entities go hand in hand, especially as they relate to building IT as a competency. You will be deploying several new technologies in year one. That's a fact. If you hope to have any prayer of success, you will need to establish an excellent business training regimen. The bottom line is that for every new technology that will be deployed, there needs to be an appropriate amount of training targeted towards the appropriate people. The process for instituting this shift is not necessarily a linear path. You can start by creating a centralized educational model, e.g. a corporate branded training program, and then filling in the gaps with actual training and documentation. You can fill in those gaps and merge that information ultimately into a centralized educational model. You can partner with other functional lines, such as HR and quality, right out of the gate to build a comprehensive structure or build yours first and include other groups later when you have demonstrated tangible benefits. It depends on your preferred approach and how capable the business is at coming together for an initiative focused on the quote unquote softer side of skill building. Regardless of the approach taken, for you to consider your training program to be a success, the following standards should be met. One, users, e.g. employees, have the skills to appropriately utilize te technologies required for their jobs. Two, users are routinely updated on changes related to those technologies through additional training, email communications, and Slack posts. Three, new technologies are often deployed with comprehensive training for the entire user base and assurances that those training pieces have been effectively completed. And lastly, a record of all training offered and the number of employees who have taken it is kept. It can be easy to think that an off-the-shelf learning management system can solve this entire process for you, while an LMS is a useful tool for team-based and platform-based learning, its adoption and usefulness only succeed when there is a mature learning culture behind it. I recommend placing an LMS on your long-term radar with a plan to assess it sometime in year two or year three, we will cover this later on. We have enough to consider in year one for our training approach. And though I have said above that it's not merely a linear path, there are effectively eight common elements to a training program. We will examine them in a relatively logical order. One, eliminate your assumptions. Your end users may know technology, but they don't necessarily understand technology. I can and do recall when you could hand a new employee a Windows PC with a copy of Office on it, and they were on their own. It was just assumed they knew what to do next, vis-a-vis -vis the day's culture. A new employee's world was far more tangible, and the access concept of online versus offline was developing, to say the least. In a relatively short period of time, we have moved on to handing a new employee a laptop, and having them log into 15 or more new applications on day one and probably changing at least 10 passwords along the way just to be able to do anything. While the technology has changed, has the way we assume employees know what they are doing changed? It's a complicated question to answer as there is no real apples to apples comparison we can make between companies. Subjectively speaking, it seems we have made a little progress as an industry but not nearly at the same rate and scale that we have adopted new technologies. 
So how do we then begin to eliminate the concept of this assumption, whether based on reality or perception or somewhere between? I tend to go by this simple axiom. Anything that I deem obvious is most likely not obvious to someone else. This idea has been the primary catalyst for me to throw away assumptions about my audience. Have you ever told someone to go ahead and minimize that window while in a remote session and then watch their mouse move all over the screen in what can only be described as an unmistakable cry for help? I can no longer assume that everyone knows how to use PowerPoint, just as I can no longer assume that everyone knows how to add a Chrome extension. Do employees need to be trained in both? Well, that ultimately comes down to your environment. Suppose you are a cloud-based company that is heavily reliant on browser performance. In that case, training employees to efficiently and effectively use their browsers is worth your while. If you have an employee who has been using PowerPoint for 20 years, yet still doesn't know how to write a proper slide transition effect, it is probably worth your while to train them on how to use PowerPoint. Once you start playing back the layers of this onion, you will find that many people don't know much about many things in their world. Years of experience are in no way equivalent to technological mastery. Think about all the other assumptions you are making about your company's employees and their understanding of technology at this very moment. Yep, you've got some work to do. Step two, design your curriculum. Now that you've taken a few moments to consider your assumptions, let's examine how we can correct them by creating a year one curriculum for your business. A good curriculum will consider all of the possible levels and aspects of training which can be consolidated into seven critical types of offerings. This is for current technology already in place, like Office, Chrome, Windows 10, Mac OS, Adobe Acrobat, how to print, how to scan, et cetera. Then there's general training for new technology coming out in the future. For instance, you're going to ro roll out single sign-on this year. You're going to roll out a cloud file storage example, a PO system, an expense system, you name it, that's general training for things to come. Then you have a specific training on key elements of the technology you already have in place. So we've talked about general training for what's in place. Now you're talking about very specific training for what you have in place. This includes levels 201 and 301 of the classes you've already taught. So if you taught Google Chrome 101, now it's time to teach advanced 201 and 301 to those users who rely on Chrome every day as part of their actual core job. You also want to teach advanced offerings for product suites you already have, such as Office and Acrobat. Then there's user requested training. Number four, learning how to use resources in your Gantt tool, for instance, or building a read-only API for an application, or creating a new Google site for a project. These are things the users clearly need to know to perform a function, but maybe it's just one or two users at a time. You have informal and ad hoc training. Number five. As lunch and learns, it's aggregated questions on a specific topic whereby you provide all the answers, uh, training on a new but relatively unimportant part of technology, and Q&A follow-ups. And there's vendor issue training. It's enterprise platforms, especially those with multiple modules, like an ERP, and administrator and train the trainer type training. And lastly is process training, like SOX controls, uh, AUP and WISP training, GDPR training, how to submit a new hire ticket training. These are process trainings. And though this list is IT centric, there will likely be occasions when other functional lines are needed to assist in the training. Especially when one of those functional lines launches a new platform. For instance, IT will undoubtedly coordinate the training for the new expense platform. Still, a member of AP or possibly even the vendor will most likely perform the training. As you think about the types of training you plan on offering from the list above and how you will coordinate them, it is never too late to start thinking about how to brand all of them under a single name. There are far better alternatives than IT training out there, as corny as some may seem. Think of a cool name and consolidate your training underneath that as part of your broader business communication. When you formally launch, Nerds for Life Academy, you will incorporate a new concept into the corporate ethos. And the business will immediately learn that all classes under the NLA banner are part of your broader training program. Introducing new technologies or processes can be a significant challenge for organizations, 
as employees may resist change or struggle to adapt to new working methods. Training is crucial in ensuring successful adoption and minimizing resistance to change. By using training as a tool for change management, IT leaders can help employees understand the benefits of new technologies, provide them with the skills and confidence to embrace change, and ultimately drive successful implementation. When designing a training curriculum for new technologies or processes, consider the following strategies to support change management. Number one, communicate the why. Before diving into technical details, make sure employees understand the reasons behind the change. Communicate how the new technology or process aligns with business objectives and how it will benefit both the organization and the individual employees. This helps create a sense of purpose and motivation for learning. Number two, address concerns and fears. Change is intimidating. Employees may have concerns or fears about how new technologies will impact their roles or even job security. Provide open dialogue and feedback opportunities and actively address their problems or questions. This helps build trust and reduces resistance to change. Number three, tailor your training to different audiences. Recognize that employees may have different levels of technical expertise or learning styles. Tailor your training approach to accommodate these differences, offering a mix of hands-on workshops, self-paced e-learning, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. This ensures that all employees can learn in a way that works best for them. Number four, provide ongoing support. Change is a process, not a one-time event. Provide ongoing support and resources to help employees navigate the transition and build their skills over time. This can include regular check-ins, access to a knowledge base or help desk, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and collaboration opportunities. And lastly, celebrate success. Employees who adopt new technologies and processes celebrate their successes, share positive outcomes with the wider organization, so-and-so just completed this program. This helps build momentum and encourages others to embrace the change. Incorporating change management principles into your training can create a more supportive and engaging learning environment. It helps employees adapt to new technologies and processes. This ensures successful implementation and fosters a culture of continuous learning and innovation within your organization. Step three, introduce training through DYKs and two MVs. When it comes to bringing training to the masses, the barrier to entry is very low. You can start small with did you knows or DYKs and two minute videos or two MVs. Use all of your help desk tickets and any direct questions you may have taken from employees as your fodder for ideas for DYKs and two MVs. For instance, when that person sent you a direct message on Slack asking how to set up a pin on their iPhone, that is your call to arms. Wire up Snagit, Camtasia, or whatever else you use. Make a quick 2MV. You can churn these things out all day. And it's a great way to show a high level of proactivity and start getting the employees used to seeing the NLA brand. These DYKs and 2MVs need a home and a method of distribution. Three ways immediately come to mind. One, a brief DYK post with a screenshot on your Slack board in an IT how-to channel. Did you know that you can dot, dot, dot? Number two, a brief how-to video posted in a Slack channel or emailed link. Three quick steps towards improving your dot, dot, dot. Number three, a brief how-to document shared in a Slack channel, Google site, or your help desk. How to install a dot, dot, dot. Note the recurring theme of the actions, brevity. Users have neither the time nor the attention span for long documents, posts, or videos. However, they have many questions that they are either too busy or too embarrassed to ask you. When one person asks you a question, I can guarantee you that at least one other person in the business can also benefit from that answer. DYKs and 2MVs can and will evolve into longer outputs as the weeks and months go on. A DYK on submit an expense report in three easy steps will eventually be complemented by the how to use the entire expense report system guide, which probably weighs in at a few more pages. On the other hand, on the one hand, you have just given the user the answer to the essential information in three short steps. On the other hand, those who wish to do more with the system also have an official guide to reference. I recommend that wherever possible, you always try to have two versions for all of your training elements. The abridged version of your training listing your key actions, 
Friends is a one-pager cheat sheet and the official manual. When I teach classes on Google Drive, for instance, the classes themselves are 60 minutes and very comprehensive. But in the end, the user walks away with a one-page visual cheat sheet and a link to the full 12-page guide, as well as a link to a folder of a few dozen 2MVs. My analytics shows me that the one-page guide gets referenced and sadly printed the most, the videos get watched relatively frequently, and the manual rarely gets looked at. Plus, I post frequent DYK and 2MVs in the Google Slack channel to always answer the questions before they are asked. It seems like a lot of work, but it only takes a little time. Additionally, you can enlist the help of your partner and other IT staff do the same every day. Suppose you have a department of three people. And every person puts out one training-specific communication each week. In that case, you will have cont contributed 150 or more new training elements to your company in a single year. One final note in step three, as you think about creating videos and documentation, ensure consistency and relevance to the language and terminology you and your staff use in written documents and videos. I'm going to cite three specific examples, which to anyone who knows me well, will be no surprise to read here. One, do not interchangeably use the words hit, clack, or click, tap, touch, and select. Pick one and use it, always. I have always insisted my staff use the word select, as in select the window, select the menu item, and select the icon. Select is platform, OS, and equipment agnostic. Number two, learn the difference between open, go to, and navigate to. You open an app, you go to a dialog box, you navigate to a page. This distinction is especially important since many of your help desk requests will be for mobile devices. And number three, when writing lists and using bullets, know when to use periods and when to leave them out. Do you think I'm the only IT leader with these types of control issues with documentation? Just wait until you see some of the crap that flows into your inbox trying to be passed off as acceptable documentation, then come back to me and talk. Step four, incentives, gamification, and recognition. Your employees need to make time for training. When you first start and announce the NLA, you may get some mild applause, but by and large, after employees spend a few minutes of wondering what's in it for them, they're going to move along. You need to conceive of a way to get them to want to come to your training, even if it is mandatory. I found the best way to do this is by gamifying the process. The central philosophy of gamification has its share of fans and detractors. When used correctly, I believe it can be a beneficial model for getting adults to do things they would normally not do. However, gamification is not just about giving away tangible items as rewards. As a central philosophy, gamification is about giving away recognition as a reward for accomplishing goals and along the way, collecting some cool swag. Few adults will turn down a gift certificate to Starbucks, so you can't go wrong there. An even better approach relies on a progressive recognition system where rewards and incentives compound as the employee participates in training. Even if an employee has to take a course that is mandatory or part of a new platform rollout, you can, by gamifying it, incentivize them to take additional training by awarding them some type of growth-based achievement, e.g. points, for attending the mandatory training. So what can that look like? Well, here's a very abridged, the very possible and easy to maintain gamification system for the NLA. And again, I'll show this on the screen. Level one, youngling, one point equals $1 in gift certificate points for Starbucks or Dunks. Level two, Padawan, 10 points for rewards equals $25 Amazon gift certificate. Level three, Jedi Knight, 20 points equals Apple TV. Level four, Jedi Master, 30 points, AirPods. Level five, The Force, 40 points, one year subscription to Netflix, and so on. In the system above, employees gain one point for every 15 minutes of training they attend. Further, employees can also earn points by actively contributing positive actions, such as reporting a phishing email, one point, contributing a 2MV or DYK to the how-to channel, two points, or directly helping another employee to solve a problem, three points. Therefore, if employees are forced to give up half their day to attend ERP training, they can at least walk away with a very nice starting cushion of points. They are then immediately incentivized to help others with the ERP platform from taking 
other trainings since they realized how easy it is to move up the ladder of progression and recognition. It sounds pretty silly, but even visual recognition alone, such as a certificate in a cubicle or some type of special badge added to an avatar, is a powerful motivational tool for employees. Many SaaS platforms offer a progressive recognition system already built in or allow for third-party modules that add this functionality. My preferred help desk system offers this right out of the box for agents and employees. Employees will see that others have a special attribute and know that this person understands technology in an advanced or unique way. There's also a fringe benefit to this, though I'll admit it stems from an intrinsic desire. I have found that it is personally very satisfying to award a certificate to an employee who has demonstrated technical proficiency. Though the certificate is not recognized in any kind of industry way, that person can note it on their LinkedIn profile anyway. They can also use it in a resume and walk away with the satisfaction of knowing they performed at a level worthy of it. It's a good feeling to give these away to deserving employees. And along the lines of recognition, training is an additional opportunity for you to collaborate with HR and get them involved. Employees and their managers can generate tangible career development goals that involve technology training. Employees can even graduate to become trainers or mentors themselves. You will have employees who know as much or as much about specific platforms as you, so why not find a way to celebrate and utilize that gift? Number five, crowdsourcing and the use of external training. Let me be clear on one point. You can't just start co-opting employees for your training goals, even with gamification. What you can do, however, through your gamification system, is build a core of volunteer trainers across the business. Your volunteers will be both empowered and incentivized to help others, and in doing so, they will increase the available training fabric and improve the overall understanding of technology in the business. What do we call this? Say it with me loud and clear, building IT as a competency. Additionally, there are many resources available online that you can use to augment your training and improve your overall construct of the NLA. You don't need to invent anything yourself, especially with other powerful training platforms, such as Coursera, Udemy, and Khan Academy, as they provide wonderful free and low-cost training modules that folks in your business can enjoy in their own time. For that one employee who needs to understand how to create macros in Excel, it is clear that you could certainly teach the class yourself, but why not consider just recommending to take a class in, at Udemy for just a few dollars? They can take the training on their own time, or invaluable concepts, report that they have completed their goal. You just made an already valuable resource more valuable and it only costs you about 10 bucks. Now, don't go and just start pawning off all of your training on external resources, but utilize them as another training resource in the NLA course structure. You can even broker a deal with that employee and you will pay for the class if they're willing to be a resource on macro creation for other employees. Again, that, that word competency. Number six, broadcast updates. We covered using Slack or whatever other platforms you may have for broadcasting your DYKs and 2MVs. What happens when the things you discuss in the videos or notes change? For instance, Google is notorious for frequent UI changes in its platforms. The video you made today on this Google app will be obsolete in six months. You need to develop a mechanism that allows you to keep tabs on what you have created and then use your broadcast mechanism to alert others when content has changed and specifically what has changed. When is an update worth broadcasting? I tend to think of it like this. If only the UI changed, but the functionality did not, I would just passively update the content, version it accordingly, and move on. However, suppose the UI changed dramatically and there's an update to that functionality. Well, in that case, I will broadcast via the appropriate channels, an update and a description of what has changed and where to go to see the latest video or documentation. This is no different from what you would do in your everyday business communications anyway. I call it out here because you want to ensure your employees know about significant changes in their apps. By training them to look at the corresponding Slack channel or some other known location first, they will go there to see the latest videos and updates before they rain down fury on the help desk. This, of course, requires that you know that an update to a DYK, 2MV, or how-to is necessary to begin with, and you must make the changes preemptively. This is where your core of Jedi masters from the NLA will help you because you will not likely see every single platform in real time and recognize when changes occur, but they will. Number seven, recording courses. If you take a cue from our online training partners, you can see the value in creating content that can be viewed unlimited times. 
If you will hold a one hour class using Google Drive, record the class, and then make it available to everyone. While this does not absolve you from holding additional training, it can cut down on the overall amount of training you need to have. It can tr make training more convenient for those whose schedules do not permit one hour training during the day. You should record every single training you hold and make them available to everyone in an easy to find structure. This is especially helpful when it comes to onboarding new employees. You will still want to hold your initial onboarding meeting in person, of course, but you cannot possibly block out an entire day for a new employee, train them on all the technology they need to know. Instead, cover the essentials in your onboarding session and provide them with the links to the most important videos to ensure they get off on the right foot. If you have 60, 60 training videos, maybe they only need to view seven in their first week. You can prioritize which ones they need to watch for them and then follow up with them at the end of the week to see how things went and answer any questions. Number eight, measuring the results. Lastly, we come to the value element of training. Subjectively speaking, there is clear and absolute value in training employees to be better at anything. I tend to prefer the abstract model of, if training costs X, then the return of the value of training is X times infinity. Now, while that model may suffer some mathematical inconsistencies, I wasn't a math major after all, the incontestable truth is that all training provides some type of measurable and longer term value from the formal training, e.g. where you sit down and listen to an instructor to the three minutes you spend with an employee to resolve the help desk issue. If the net result is an improvement, that is measurable value. Every single time you sit down with an employee to answer a question or respond to an issue it is a teachable moment or more specifically a training. Your day is filled with hundreds of potential training moments in year one you will have hundreds more opportunities to train employees and further demonstrate the value of IT. We have already reviewed the need to demonstrate IT's value ad nauseum. We have also connected the dots between what value and relationship to developing IT is a competency. competency. If every employee is getting better at what they do, thereby improving the business as a whole, as a result of what IT is doing in terms of training, that is measurable proof of the value of IT. Measuring the importance of training happens in two distinct buckets, the conclusive hard data you get from your metrics and the subjective data you get from the business. Let's break this down further using a few key examples, including how we would analyze the data on some types of value added training. So I'm gonna show another table up on the screen here in a moment. But basically, I'll just go through these at a high level. The objective value data from training. Well, there's three. Support metrics. And basically, accurate and improved training yields fewer support tickets. Two, platforms metrics. Relevant and accurate training results in faster adoption of platforms. And number three, security metrics. Targeted awareness training results in fewer breaches and security incidents. Now, on the subjective side, we also have three. We have employee performance where employees spend more time being productive and less time waiting for support. Number two, we have employee retention. Employees stay. If they continue to improve via training, resulting in increasing responsibility. And lastly, employee engagement and happiness, or EX. Employees are happy as they get free on-the-job training in the areas of technology that are most important to them. One other piece of data that does not fit into either bucket above is employee feedback data. This generally tends to be about the training they have taken either internally or externally. Be sure to have a brief survey available to employees immediately after taking every single one of your classes. Don't be afraid to withhold award points until you receive the feedback. You can use this feedback to improve your training model continuously. Have them rate you or the trainer or the, and the content, the delivery, and other relevant data points. Furthermore, if you are paying employees to attend training from external sources or even sending them offsite for training, have a form to complete when they return. Provide that data back to the company. For instance, if someone attended a public speaking class and they were dissatisfied with the training, you can ensure that no one else makes the same mistake of paying for that specific class. Measuring training results is essential for demonstrating the value of your initiatives and continuously improving your programs. To provide a structured approach to evaluation, consider using the Kirkpatrick model, which is the one I prefer, which is a widely recognized framework that assesses training effectiveness at four levels. Reaction, learning, behavior, and results. So for level one reaction, this level measures participants' initial reaction to the training. Was it relevant and engaging? Was the delivery method effective? Number two, learning. This level assesses how participants have acquired new knowledge, skills, or attitudes to the training. 
using pre and post assessment assessments, quizzes, or hands-on exercises, you can know these learning outcomes. Number three, behavior. This level evaluates how well participants apply their new knowledge or skills. Number four, results. This level measures the training's tangible impact on business outcomes, such as increased productivity, reduced costs, or improved customer satisfaction. Using the Kirkpatrick model to evaluate your training programs, you can either gather data, sorry, you can gather data at each level to demonstrate the effectiveness and value of your initiatives. This data can then be used to, one, justify training budgets and secure ongoing support from executives and managers. Two, identify areas for improvement and optimize future training programs. Three, communicate the impact of training on individual performance and business outcomes. And four, make data-driven decisions about training investments and priorities. As you collect this data, aggregate it into a meaningful format and present it to the business. Demonstrate to the managers and executives that the NLA isn't just about your contrived scheme, but that absolute value is applied to employee training. By illustrating the value of training, you also promote IT as an integral, integral component of the business and more than just a glorified help desk. This will open new doors for IT, from allowing you to expand the NLA by allocating more money for training in subsequent budget years, to more internal partnerships as other groups want to get involved with all the great stuff you are doing. Everyone in the business will, will come to realize there's value in training. Regarding training, you can't just look at someone, read their title, or troll their LinkedIn bio and assume they know what to do. You also can't assume that they don't. The bottom line is that you just can't assume at all. Everyone who comes in your organization knows something about technology. You must ascertain their skill level and provide the necessary training to fill the gaps. It is also up to you to get them to attend and complete the trainings so they can come out the other side and improve. In year one, you will not be deploying new technologies that will be essential for use, not only in year one, sorry, in year one, you will be deploying new technologies that will be essential for use not only in year one, but also in subsequent years. If you build your technology foundation on a weak level of comprehension across the business, your technology plan will fail. Don't let anyone slip through the cracks. Now, I'm not going to read a summary and key takeaways for this chapter because it was quite long. I want to drive dive right into the chapter analysis, but you can read the chapter summary and key takeaways um, online in the book. So, Mike, um, wow. it's a good one. All, all of the yeah, um, all the questions that I sort of asked you before, obviously, were premeditated towards what I just went through. Um, oh. But so, I instead of going back to those questions, let's just kind of start anew. Um, hold on, let me just make a note here. Yeah. So, number one, like before I read this chapter. I mean, we had some assumptions about trust and, um, you know, the differences between different generations of training and uh, managers' involvement. So has anything changed in your perspective or do you still sort of feel the same way now? No, I, I feel that training is important and gamifying is important and having, you know, different approaches for each group is important. Um, I mean, I don't think there's any major change. I think a lot of what you read applies to to what we were saying before. Um, but I guess um, one of the big things that comes out of the chapter just as a whole is the amount of effort you put into training is what you'll get out of it, right? The You put more effort into it, the more you're going to get out of it. If you, if you take the time to have some analytics and you have some gamification and you and you and you're building sort of coalitions within the business that are training and and helping you train. Um, that it creates a good cross functional training experience and drives value to IT and to other organizations as well. Builds teamwork, builds collaboration. If you're working towards a centralized goal to make using your tools more efficient and better, uh, it totally makes sense. Um, so I don't, I don't think uh, anything has changed hugely. Um, I, I think, think it's applying those techniques makes a lot of uh, makes a lot of sense. And 
we're really happy. The bigger, the bigger question underneath all this, Mike, is uh, sorry to interrupt you, but no, go ahead. Uh, you just you just made this point. I wanted to capture it. I think the bigger question is, I mean, the the real big question is, how much should IT do for training? And mm -hmm. I, I I realize it's sort of an unanswerable question, but who else sure. in the business? invest as much time training people as IT. Yeah. I mean, everyone, like almost all the GNA functions have to train to a degree. Sure, 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 sure. No, I, I think IT does does a lot of it. I think uh, depending on the organization, you know, in a lot of companies, different GNA functions have different level of training. It depends on who owns training for the whole company too. Sometimes that's legal. Sometimes it's HR. Sometimes it's quality. Depends on uh, what you've got. So there's there's sort of the being able to work with those groups and decide whether or not you know there needs to be an owner or more of a committee based model with training. I think IT holds the data to make training effective, but IT does a lot of the training, if not the most training. To your point, because there are so many different things to train on, whether it's compliance related well, items or it's tools or it's um, cybersecurity or awareness. Uh, IT does a, a lot of that. Yeah, it's absolutely one of the core, should be one of the core capabilities ask, of IT. Let me ask you this question then. So in terms of your, and your, you maybe either you can answer for your last company yeah. or for this one, but in terms of your 2024 or prior company strategic goals, was training a strat goal for IT? Um, probably, probably not in a, in a, in a strategic goal. I think it's, it's been baked into, it should be, it should be, but it has, it hasn't been as much. I think it's been more interlaced. You actually the... call it out in your strategic plan for it. Yep. I, I, have you ever called it out? Cause I haven't. No, no. I think I've always interlaced it in as an assumption that we have to train on a number of different, um, yeah, I mean it's it's baked in, right? Like in twenty twenty four, we're gonna put in platforms A, B, and C, and yep. as part of that, in our, pl our platform implementation governance, we'll have a training, et cetera, right? But like a training, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. How do you how do you capture today, if at all, mm -hmm. the the burden of training, or the not burden? How do you yeah. capture the the consumption of res of resources for training today? Don't. No, I don't. No, I haven't, and it's definitely a you know an area of which to explore and uh, to to consider definitely, and it's especially well, before some. Before you say that, though, is it, and how would we? Well, I think it's it's here. Here's the thing: it's it's kind of a some of it is just what what we're talking about right now is is it valuable? Is training valuable? And right now, it's it's an assumption to some extent that it is because people get better and they, you know, they learn how to use a tool and there's less clicks and they have a better employee experience if they're trained is, is an assumption. And we don't capture data to say that it is right. So some of what you just mentioned was gamifying and being able to have a point system it gives you that visibility that if people aren't training, then maybe you shouldn't keep investing in it. You've got to find a better way or you're not doing a good job at it. And there's going to be a better way. Training is a difficult one because everyone wants to be trained until they have to go. Yes. And, and, and the system, the things that have to be trained on, the ones they show up for are the ones that either are replacing something they use every day or something they have to do because it's compliance and it's, and it's their job and it's whether they keep their job. Um, other stuff that's nice to have you know, it's in their mind, or they don't understand the value, it's very difficult to have that resonate and bring people in. So it's having data that says, yeah, nobody went to these nine trainings we spent $20,000 on. Uh, we've tried it three years in a row. We've collected all the data. Um, it's not an IT problem, maybe. Well, so hold on. I, I mean, just, <laughs> that, that's a great point. So let's suppose that you go out and spend $20,000 on training program XYZ and people show up and they don't necessarily do a great job is that your fault no that's that's manager's yeah. fault that's is that a cultural issue within the company that is is it also that people are too busy 
and they're overworked and they don't have time to learn on their own. Which is or... also a problem. Yeah. Because if people are, if people are too overworked, work. if they oh, can't train, they can't train, then they've reached their apogee of effective effectiveness for the company. Like they can't go higher than that. They can't. And they don't, even if it, it enabled them to be able to do more with less, they don't have time to learn. And I mean, that's, and that does happen at different companies. Um, but whenever there is something new or whenever there's something that people don't understand or they, they want to learn, they do ask for training. I mean, I have definitely found that a lot of people will ask and, or will even say, why haven't we been trained on this yet? You know, <laughs> right. Um, and then you do all the, I'm a big proponent of the Slack videos and the, the helpful hints and, and, and those type of things. Consumption is low. I mean, it's great that it's there. It's a good, they can search for it when they want to. Uh, even people who are putting in service now and they have these big knowledge bases, it's only as good as how updated you keep it, which is a huge overhead for, for IT departments. Okay. And and people have to search for it and find it. And then it's four or five extra steps. And I'm not, I'm not trying to at all poo-poo on it. It's more of no, just, I... it's just about reality. And People will ask for training until they need to take the time to train. Uh, this whole, it's all, yeah. that's all I'm saying. Well, this whole chapter is predicated on the on the basis that you're a new IT leader in a company. You you're in your first year. Yep. You really want to make the biggest impact possible. You want people to have a great employee experience. You want them to embrace technology. You have a shit ton of change control coming. You're putting in new platforms. You're ripping things out. You have all this work to do. And so obviously there's a burden of training upon you because you're the instigator of this change. Sure. But but this chapter is predicated on the fact that that's not where that ends. That yeah. you're you're actually responsible for every single bit of training. Yeah. And I wrote this chapter because I've never felt differently than that point. You are you are responsible for for the training of the systems that you own and in a small company you may own all the systems. Um but to the first question, one of the first questions you asked earlier tonight was about talking about Generation Alpha, Gen, Gen Y, Gen Z, um, Gen X, all the all the however one generations there just, are. Well, just be a letter; it doesn't matter. Is um, a, you know, throw some shit at the wall, and see what sticks. I mean, I hate to use that, but you just don't know. It depends on the culture of your company. Like for example, at Cardurian right now. There are little short videos in Slack. We're doing a couple lunch and learns. Um, people have embraced the technology. A lot of people that we've, we've put in, they've embraced the technology. There are some that have asked for trainings and uh, they're very conscientious and listen and go through the training, which is fantastic. I think if you double the size of the company, um, there are gonna be some people who do not have time to train, but will watch a short snippet video and, the, and get something out of that. Or they, Go to some of the YouTube videos or where they search YouTube and they do something like that. Some that will show up the in-person uh, training. So it's it sounds kind of gross to throw the shit at the wall and see what sticks. But everybody learns differently. So to not overdo one area, yeah. so not to overdo like the perfect knowledge base and spend all your time on it or the perfect syllabus for an in-person training or the perfect learning manual for this application do a little bit in each area that applies to those different ways of learning and see what works for the culture of your company. If you're a new IT leader and just see what's feel out what works for the, for, for your team. If you're 15, 20 people, you can get everyone in a room once a quarter. That's great. Um, but if you're, you're continuing to grow and you get a remote workforce, you get people in other countries, they may have a different way that they want to learn than, than you can provide. Yeah. So, I, that's where I think those analytics um, could come in handy is if you are spreading it across many different mediums and you want to see what resonates, having some way of seeing that I think is valuable, but um, it's going to be hard with all the other things you're going to have to kind of um, move forward in that first year or two. Um, well, let's talk about incentivizing people and gamifying what you're yeah. doing. Yeah. Uh, so to what degree right now do you, incentivize if at all i know that you're only in the sixth or seventh month and mm -hmm. or, and, or, and or gamify training do you do it all right now no not 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 yet it's a great idea great thought 
Um, and do you have plans to do it in the next year or so? Um, I have I haven't gone to that extent yet. Um, but it's definitely something I'll think about. But I don't have a plan to do it yet. No. Yeah, we never. I haven't launched mine either yet, and I, I'm remiss on that point. But because you know, we never got to a point yet and it, it would come. I mean, certainly we got, never got to a point where we made our environment complicated enough that um, there was a need to sort of introduce this. Uh, we rolled out. That's a key point, right? I, I think even before training, if you're not building a, if you, you're building a complex environment or you've inherited one, then you kind of have no other choice. Yeah. But even before training, if you're building solutions that don't require a lot of training, that's that's a double win. Yeah, I mean, it could still be done. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to say like gamification isn't possible in my scenario, but it's more like, um, you know, I we average like four tickets a month, so I'm not getting like the 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 the, the environment doesn't change enough. It's not dynamic enough to warrant it. But I can see where there's still a place for it. Um, like I don't, I don't have to corral users necessarily to take training, but I've had to chase people down to get into a room. And the incentive, the incentive is if you don't do it, like, you won't, you won't get an account. And <laughs> that's usually like, I don't know, it's, it's sort Way of a do it, reverse man. incentive. Um, so do it. And that's a GXP way, right? You know, yeah. you get into a system without being trained in any oh. way. There's no, there's no uh, problem with doing that on those crucial apps too. Even that are... So um, let's switch over to the, uh, one of the things I mentioned regarding external training uh, yeah. sources. Okay. So I've put many, many users through Coursera, um, which I, which IT pays for. Yep. Uh, in fact, I just put one, another user through Tableau the other day uh, yep. through Coursera and uh, I've used other platforms as well. We're always recommending classes. Like, to what extent do you place value in using external resources for training? Like, place value. Uh, you know, LinkedIn Learning was huge. In, you know, in my last company, we used that a lot. You find, just out of curiosity, I mean, just tangentially, I, I find it to be completely useless. But have you found value in that? For the basic stuff to learn, um, you know what the best place is to go is to YouTube. Mm -hmm. I, I actually um, have pointed everyone to YouTube um, for it's better the calculus than, of IT on YouTube. Better than yeah yeah exactly right there, uh, but that but that's better than what you get yeah. on a lot of these paid services because small bites, um, much more laid back, usually based business case driven, much more human. Um, it often curates and brings them somewhere it gives them multiple ways to see the same thing or multiple videos to see the same training, you know? Um, so, and I, I can't uh, sort of endorse it enough. Yeah. There's some bad data there too, and might not be always accurate, but um, having a more structured course where someone is intimidated by the 15, you know, sections of the training, they're like, screw this. I don't have time for this and I'm never going to. So screw this. It's too complicated. And then I go to YouTube and I've got a 10 minute video that gets me far enough to get my, you know, get myself salivating and, you know, to figure out and learn more that, that, that is a better on ramp for a lot of users, I think, than these big training sets. But with LinkedIn learning, it's, Hey, I get a certificate on my page and I just did this thing. And there's, I mean, there's benefit to that too. Um, but I think at least some of the technical trainings, it's hard for them to keep up um the i guess the, the with the changes that are happening um and there's many people sitting in their basement waiting for the next you know microsoft bing announcement you know or whatever um that they can train on so like take the microsoft mvps you know that are i know we're talking about microsoft but microsoft mvps that are you know when there's a new air horn loaded sorry yeah when something is new in uh, uh announced the next day they are on training about it when something is announced from notion for example the people are obsessed with notion they are on the next day showing how to use it that doesn't happen in linkedin learning or in udemy or in coursera i mean they're great products but if you really need to be up to speed with something or you have a very specific need um, i'm a big fan of youtube 
So you just called it Udemy. Have I been calling it wrong all these years? I'm probably calling it wrong. What 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 are you calling it? Udemy. Udemy. Oh, I just called the item. I may I may have it wrong. I've only I've only used it a couple of times. So <laughs> yeah. okay. we agree that it's Coursera, though. I mean, that's that Coursera. One's... Yeah, yeah. I like Coursera. I like Coursera. Um, so in the chapter, I made the statement, which uh, you know, I still stand by. Yeah. Well, it's not the only shortest route, but the, the statement was the shortest route to technological debt is bypassing training. So the you, short of you, to having that to having technical debt is bypassing technological training. debt is by bypassing training. Do you no. agree or disagree with that statement? Um, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah. If you, you have, if don't train on on certain things, yeah, you're just asking for peril. Yeah, I mean that's been my experience for years, which is so and so functional line wants a platform. It's usually being run, it's being, you know, uh, asked for by a single individual who had at their last company that they, they finally managed to sort of like steamroll their way through the, to get the platform in. They um, refuse training. That person who wanted the platform then leaves the company uh, and nobody else knows how to use it or why it's even there. And then you end up with technological debt um, to carry for quite a while. Uh, it doesn't have to be that the person even leaves, just that no one gets trained and therefore you have years of people just saying this thing's a piece of shit. There's uh, no continuity planning continuity. in place. And yeah. some, and I guess it, close, a very, very close second, if not just as important, is you talked earlier on about kind of the IT steering committee or decision making or just an overall yeah. approval process for budget. It doesn't even have to be a steering committee. Um, just strong partnership with the CFO. Is that that certain things need to be scrutinized before they're implemented? Yeah, um, there's going to be sure. some analysis done, and that's um, that should keep some of these things from from be getting geared up and becoming just technical debt that never gets used or has to be supported and costs money. Um, so I made one more assertion, which uh, we'll we'll and we'll close with this. Yep. Um, but right towards the end of my chapter read. I talked about the importance of uh, measuring yeah. the, impact, the impact of uh, training yeah, and the different ways you can measure it, three subjective, three um, objective. Yep. And I know I, what I remember, I remember writing that chapter and I, and I've reviewed it recently and I only made a few small updates, but I left that section alone because I still think to this day at those six methods, and I'll just re sort of reread those really quickly. Um, but the three objectives were support metrics, platform metrics, and security metrics, whereas the three subjective were employee performance, employee retention, and employee engagement and happiness. Sure. So those six that I asserted were like the keys for um, measuring impact of training. Would you add others? Would you say that there's a there's additional ways to think about how when you give a training, you can you can walk away saying that was effective because of X. Like, like, what do you think about that in terms of measuring what you just did, what you just gave an employee, and measuring it back to, in terms of the business? I think one that's a, I don't know you can, you can probably capture these manually, but it's how many questions did you get? I think if you get a classroom or a bunch, you know, you get people who are truly just not engaged, um, then you're you're just that reading that is, and it's not just questions; it's you know, body language and other things, or is yeah. everyone's camera shut off and you know all that stuff. Um, you know, is that is that training going to be really engaging for people? And I think that's people tune out when they within the first, you know, half hour or so, if they don't understand how they're actually going to use this tool to get their job done, you know, what, that they're, what's their, what's the use case for them? Um, how can you measure that? S sometimes I think it's some of the best trainings I've, I've, I've done or, or, or led have been ones where there's a discussion towards the end where people are asking questions on how to do things you didn't, didn't show them. Um, or that you forgot to show them, or just maybe your training wasn't that great, but they caught it. 
and they want to know how to do something. Um, if there's no engagement and everyone's looking at their phone or you can't, you just, you get no, you get no feedback. Um, they probably haven't retained very much. Um, so but, you're, you're equivocating sort of um, the inquisitive nature of post-training with the fact that it was successful or not. I, I think that's one of the ways to, to okay. get an early, an early guy's measure of, of how things have, how things went. Um, and that's just, that's just, I guess, optics perspective, you know, how are, are people in paying attention? Are they even interested? Do they have to be there to get their signature on a sheet? Or yeah. they or they have to are they go in there because this is valuable to them. Um, how to, how to measure things that are effective is um, it's very it's very hard. I mean, again, I I gave three objective measurements, which I think are relatively you know they're softballs, right? So you're you're if you start off the year and you do a fishing baseline and it comes back that forty percent of your company is fish prone, and then you train them three times and it comes back that it's twenty percent. Yep. Well, I mean, that's uh, you have a starting number, you have an end number, they're different. There's a delta, you can measure that, right? It's like yep. it's an empirical measurement. Um, the softer side, you know, if we if, if the company loses an average of eight, eight employees a year, but we then double down on the twice the number of classes, and that number goes, it's half, you know, we lose half the typical employees per year. Can we draw that line? I mean, it's uh, I I think we can. Right. I I think um, when I think of just IT software training and it, it, it you, you take the three the three buckets. Um, I was gonna say something. I can't remember what it was now. Um. Do they do they retain what they're they, like a lot of I think the most typical thing we see is surveys, right? It's like, oh, how was this training? Did you and it's people don't really do that as much. Um, I guess their engagement on that is if they really thought it was a valuable training, they're gonna take the survey. Maybe, uh, if they have the time to do that. So some post engagement after the training is a is a good is a good tool if you can you feel like that people would do that. Um if there's interactive components, those, the those are those are more like measurable, right? Right. So you're 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 hitting on the measurable components, which is great. Yeah. Like so I, I do a class. How do you measure right. effectiveness? Right. I do a class. There's a there's a ten there's a there's a ten question survey at the end, which is uh, all um, sort of quantitative, one to five. Yep. Well, that's great. Right? Um. You need yeah. a lot of data to sort of substantiate that that class is effective. Like, cause you need, if you just have one class and the, the teacher happens to absolutely nail it that day or everyone in the class is just giving them a pass, right? Like you need, you need a steady bit of data, but ultimately it's empirically measurable data. Yep. I, I go back to the, just trying to cover as many different types of learning as you can and not spending as much time in trying to measure the the impact of one specific training because it's going to take a lot for you to do that or, or even may not even be successful um and to try and make sure you cover as many of the areas of of learning that you can if it's something that people need to learn um tips and tricks always good like you said that one pager you you mentioned Nate gets a lot of traffic that's People have a good reference, a simple reference. I think yep. that's very useful. Um, but I think this is something that everyone in every function struggles with. How do you make training effective? How do you know what people want? How do you keep it enter somewhat engaging and I don't say entertaining, but engaging so that it is pertinent to their business line? Um, I'll never forget, there's been a number of demos that i've seen you know with from people on my team or myself even over the years and it's like that okay this is how this is this feature this is that feature and you're going through each menu item and all this stuff that is not going to work with people right right if you're like if you talk about all right i have I, I have a project i'm running right now and i need to i need to bring in a couple external project managers and we need to figure out the best way to collaborate 
on a project plan um, or have a, a discussion or a chat or whatnot, you go through an entire business process using the tool or the component where the tool fits into the business process. But that has to be specifically focused on the function, which is it. So for example, at Cardurian, the way that we're going to do training for a number of things, we'll do it again, throwing as much up in the air, right? And see what works. You know, we have the Slack channel, the Ask IT Slack channel. We have, I use a little clips for some videos and we put hints and we use Canvas to, to put up the kind of the, the, the quick tips and hints that are up there. And then we'll have the all hands meeting, all hands lunch and learns type stuff where we'll do that once a quarter. Um, and there's a, some some meetings where we'll be on site and we'll be able to give some overview of the tool sets. But I think the most effective face-to-face -face training will be going- Sorry, sorry before you go on, but you can- function. That's the most, the best way to go. Not, not doing big groups and it takes more time, but going to finance and teaching them how to use Box or Slack. Let's say we're using the kind of enterprise tool sets for them in their day to day is going to be more effective than trying to give a training to sixty people who work in different parts of the the business. You're only able to the general basic stuff that they need to know, but not things that are really valuable for them to uh, to make them work better. So, sorry to interrupt you before. No, the question I had though, right at that point, was that if you if you did like a all company training at one of these meetings or something, yeah. we obviously can't measure the effectiveness of that right away. Um, yeah. They're not but, that effective. I don't think. But would you, would you take the time to try and tie it back over time? Like let's say at the Q2 all hands meeting, I had a 30 minute slot, to teach everybody how to, you know, use box relay. Right. And I didn't get any tickets or I, yeah. And then, and then after for the, for the next Six months, my ticket count for Box Relay went down fifty percent. Yep. Or 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 you look at the usage of Box Relay and see that it's gone up, and that's another metric, right? That it's being used, it's valuable. But our, I mean, so uh, with the with the with the absolute bulk of training that I've done, hundreds of hours at Exilio of training, to try and draw some of those lines outside of sort of the the empirical metrics is extraordinarily difficult. But I ultimately think, honestly, in an ideal world, and I think I've told this to every single staff I've ever worked with, like every single department I've been in, I've told my team, <laughs> the, like, if you can just get the person who's a full-time IT trainer, that is the most kick-ass role you can get for so many reasons. The, the, the biggest of which is they, I mean, right now your help desk is what defines your EX. Yep the trainer actually changes the game. And I, I, I wax know. poetic, I wax poetic on the point, but only because I, I had the opportunity once to have a trainer in IT and it was the most glorious year. <laughs> so much knowledge got known about people. Yep. In such a short period of time, it was like overwhelming. And they become uh, rock stars too, right? Trainers, everyone oh wants to be a trainer. I just don't know why more companies don't hire them, unfortunately. Um, and they leave it to knuckleheads like like me uh, to do it. But um, no, I'm just kidding. I love train. I love training. I will train all day if I can. I every single time someone comes by my desk and they're like, "Hey, do you have a quick second? I'm like, "Sure, have a seat." Like, no, no, it's just a quick question. I'm like, "No, have a seat." And before they know, 15 minutes later, they're like, "Okay, I just need to know how to print." And I'm like, "Well, now you know everything else, right? Now you know all these other things." Um, he thought you were seeing now for one question. It's not happening. <laughs> but that teach that teachable moment. Like I want them to walk away and stop doing this thing. Like every single time that they want to open up a web page, they open up Google, type the web page in the search bar, then wait, wait for the search results to come up, then click the link to go to the page. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, today we're gonna stop that shit. We're gonna make you a make you a new browser um that's awesome yeah it's uh well yeah that's awesome um <laughs> it's awesome. so training education like i don't have any kind of like grandiose final statement but ultimately that it's a very important thing i think it's huge in the sense that 
everybody acknowledges your CEO on down is going to tell you, yes, we need we need you, IT, to train people on how to use technology. No question about it. But yep. but after that moment, you have the rest of the burden. Like no one's saying your CEO isn't saying you need to train people. And oh, by the way, you need to do it using these four methods. Yep. Like no, no one, they just the, it's a broad like, hey, you have to do this. Yep. Um, there's no question about it. And like I mentioned, I mean, you can use, I mean, there's all kinds of methods you can use to train people. Um, let me find that link because I did put a link in the book. Uh, I want to just point it out here. Um, Sorry, I realize we have radio silence, which is, I guess, I guess, like the most terrible thing you can have when you're on the radio. Um, dead air. Dead air. Thank you. That's what it's called. Yeah, dead air. Brutal. Um, I don't have any jokes to say though while I'm scrolling, which is unfortunate. Hey, it's a... to kill the dead air. I don't think dead air is as big a deal on podcasts because there's no. All right, so so here's the link I was looking for. It's in a footnote. So I mentioned the Kirkpatrick model earlier. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia and look up Donald Kirkpatrick, you will read about the Kirkpatrick model, which is a training effectiveness model that uh, I only learned about about three years ago. Um, I was at, where the hell was I? I was at Orchard, so this is nearly five years ago. Um, this is a fantastic model. And you can like I gave a very high level uh, overview of it, but if you dive into the Kirkpatrick model again, it's, uh, Donald underscore uh, sorry, it's Wikipedia.org slash wiki slash Donald underscore Kirkpatrick K A R K P A R P A T R I C K. Um, you can read all about this model. <laughs> it's one of my favorites, um, but it's very data driven, and. Um, you're you're gonna have to rethink about how it is you assess people and assess your own training. Uh, if you think your training is the bee's knees or the shizzle dizzle, you may find that your training is actually terrible. It's not the employees, it's you. So um, anyway, <laughs> I'll just mention that. So <laughs> we're 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 nearly done with the ex journey. We're actually going to cover performance and assessment next week, which is kind of like the tail end of of ex which is kind of a shame because I love talking about it and we'll have to keep coming back to it. But um, do you have any final thoughts on training education, Mike? Education, good. Education, good. Very important. Um, try a few different things. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Just Learning try a few different best. avenues to get your data out and the, the things you want to train on. And it's also, you got to know your culture. You got to know if people how they want to learn and what time they have to do so. Yep. Some people just don't want to learn, by the way. It happens. It does happen. It does happen. And just you gotta pull out all the stops. You gotta find those people and you gotta you gotta make it happen. Um so stay tuned. Uh next week we're gonna bring back the AI AF podcast or episode two. We will also cover performance and assessment. It's not that long of a chapter, but it is an important topic. Um, we're not getting to the HR side. We'll get into sort of the IT side of performance and assessment and creating a career path for your staff. And um, if you enjoyed this, I know, I know I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast to give us five stars, but just give us the maximum stars. Whatever the max is, yeah. The maximum stars possible. Um, because why would you go only give us four? It doesn't make any sense. Just give us five. We appreciate it. Um, you'll feel better about yourself. Uh, you can spread a little bit of joy. And that's on all the streaming thingies. Um, <laughs> we are going to put out some jorts at some point in time. Mike assures me that we're going to have some smaller videos. We're also going to go back to the um, quirks and dorks and have episode two. I have no idea what the topic will be, but we'll find a bar and we'll have a quirks and dorks episode um, i think that um that like corner booth at patty's that we're in that was that, awesome that would be a perfect place let's go let's go that see was if, so much fun see if they'll have us 
Because you could, we could even set up a little bit in there, which because you have that little back area. That'd be yeah, cool. I mean, it'd be fun. And they have I huge, like huge. They have like sixteen ounce pints that sip of sunshine there. Can't go wrong. So um, good. Uh, so that's really it. I mean, um, I would close all, as I always do by saying, don't be a dick. Uh, now that you know how much IT, how much time IT spends on training you. Don't be a dick to IT. We're trying to make you better. We're trying to help you be the most kick-ass person that's ever walked the earth in your role and also get you ready for your next role. So don't tell us that you are you don't need to do anything new. Um, you do need to learn. You you can't predictively antiquate yourself like that. We, we have to get you to the next level. Even if you think that after 30 years of making bad transitions, you still know what to do. Um, Bark less, wag more. It'll pay off. Be cool. It'll get paid back in spades. Um, Mike, anything that you want to close with? Enjoy the rest of your week. This is an important uh, subject. There's so much to talk about next week. Yes. Um, My God. I, I won't get get us going, but there's even some non-AI stuff happening. Um, I know. I, I got like three non-AI news articles from Reuters today. There's TikTok, there's Neuralink. Yes. There's, there's a couple other things, some robotic stuff that's happening that we should talk about next week. Um, well, there'll probably be something else new by the time we get there. But there's security problems in cars. I mean, there's, oh, geez. There's actual news news and it's refreshing. Yes. I mean, it's not refreshing to see that, you know, we still have a, the largest healthcare breach ever known to man. But it is good to see that some progress.